All right. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, just as a reminder, we are recording these uh, sessions. Um, Mr. Gravatt, are you are you with us, sir? Yes, I am. Excellent. How are you? Thank you. I'm well, sir. Um, Good. And let, let me appreciate uh, your uh, flexibility with the schedule today. Oh, absolutely, sir. No problem whatsoever. We uh, we had a good discussion. Uh, so um, looking forward to your presentation, sir. Whenever you're good. ready, sir. All right. Well, um, it would probably be useful for me to share this document, wouldn't it? Which I should have thought of earlier and I did not. So indulge me for one moment. Take your time. And I believe this will get us there. Can you see it? Yes, sir. Amazing. All right. Thank you. So what I uh, came away from our meeting two weeks ago thinking was that there was quite a bit of overlap um, and also some room maybe to uh, consolidate. I, I heard loud and clear from the utilities in particular that uh, too many goals would be uh, cumbersome and challenging to prioritize, um, you know, to choose priorities between them. And so, it, but, I, but I heard a lot of um, at least general agreement about the ideas of uh, approaching uh, reductions in climate emissions, carbon emissions to preserve the climate, consistent with climate goals that the state has uh, proposed, and the idea that it's still important to save electricity and natural gas um, and help customers use those fuels as efficiently as possible. And, uh, and also that uh, addressing systemic inequities uh, was really important. And you know, one of the things I talked about two weeks ago was the idea that instead of having a whole lot of distinct goals, maybe we could think about fewer goals, but with some minimum performance standards uh, that would say, you know, this is what you need to achieve, but at least some amount of, of that has to come from something in specific. And so that's how I've tried to structure this. I, I had no intention that this would come across as a final document. Um, and I left the marginal notes just to help uh, illustrate when people were looking at it, what we were thinking about, what we were talking about uh, among the uh, efficiency advocates. Um, so, th so the overarching, really, this is framed as one single high level goal, which is about carbon savings. And really, when we look at 2024 and beyond, acknowledging that we don't know what's gonna happen between now and then, and we've had some surprises in the last couple of years, um, it seems like that the carbon emissions are really the most important um, state policy objective related to utility service and related to Empower. So in this proposal, we put carbon dioxide equivalent savings as the overarching goal. But then below that, we said, you know, if you have to achieve this number of carbon savings, and we did say life cycle savings, I'll talk more about that in a second. A certain portion of that, I don't know how much, has to come from electric efficiency savings. And another certain portion of that has to come from fuel switching fossil equipment to highly efficient electric end use technologies, heat pumps, um, potentially conductive uh, cooked cooking and, and other end uses. And the reason that we think it's important to have uh, some a designation for both of those things, um, Ms. Levin alluded to it this morning. I mean, and when I think about goals and regulation, uh, and I think I said this a couple of weeks ago, it's really, really important that the goals actually drive the utilities to do what you want them to do, which seems obvious, but it's it's not always. And without, um, you know, no disrespect or slight intended to any of the folks in the utility, if a goal made it more preferential for utilities to do a lot of fuel switching without worrying about how clean the source was, 
it would be hard for them not to do that um, because that potentially drives earnings. It dr drives uh, how regulators look at the company generally. If, if utilities are really falling flat in one area, it's hard to be successful in other areas with because it's the same regulators. So I think it's important that we have some minimum requirement that is from electric efficiency in this case, and also carbon savings from fuel switching. <clears throat> also want to suggest that there's some flexibility or you know, some amount, but not an endless amount of the carbon savings that would come from natural gas efficiency. And of course, as we discussed, our preference would be that all of the natural gas savings come from building shell improvements, process improvements, and things that do not uh, make it less likely for those customers to electrify in the future. So, you know, I don't think we've, well, in, in, in all of this, we're not drawing hard lines anywhere, but we do think it's really important to prioritize those other measures that tend to not be what natural gas utilities do as much of these days. And that's not just in Maryland. And the fourth bullet is even more vague than the rest. And what I, you know, with the conversation we've had, and I know there were, I missed some of this continued discussion earlier today about if there are innovative things that the utilities can do that are going to support the state achieving climate targets, but they don't fit in a narrow empower framework. That could be a problem because we don't want to create disincentives for the utilities to do things that are going to support the climate objectives. So here I suggest, well, what if we had, a, I mean, I think it's something that's bigger than the PID um, budgets that you have now or the utilities have now, it, but it's saying that some portion of the savings can come from innovative solutions that we don't even know what they are yet because we want to create the flexibility to explore those things, develop them, and to benefit from them. But, you know, if we're looking at, um, I'm going to go back to the three-year goal cycle, plan cycle, these could be areas for development. And if something emerges and utilities uh, uh, exploit it, let's say, and get demonstrate that there are real savings there, then I think that becomes a topic for discussion for the next cycle. So that's a, that's a, a hypothesis. It's a, it's a suggestion of something that maybe is worth a little further discussion. And then the last one is um, benefits from all four of those categories. Uh, we put in a placeholder of 40% have to flow to limited income households and those experiencing high energy burdens and historically disadvantaged communities, including communities of color. I think there's a lot of um, need to discuss further what, what that means. What does 40% of the benefits mean? Um, because this isn't all about energy savings. Um, and I imagine, um, you know, that there may be some parties who think 40% is too high. Um, we put 40% because it's consistent with what's happening in Washington with the Biden administration. And it's consistent with what uh, is happening in New York state for targets for, um, you know, for efficiency programs or more expansive programs, environment programs, um, that, that would flow to disadvantaged communities. Um, so, you know, really that's what we've got. Uh, car overarching carbon target that shall be made up of no more than or no less than several different things. And I think I actually really like this framework idea because I think it does give the utilities a fair amount of flexibility depending on where we peg those no less than and no more than numbers give some flexibility to adjust to the markets, to adapt to new opportunities, to innovate, and to still focus on achieving what's most important to the state. Now, this morning, I, uh, before I had to step off, I did want to comment on a few things that were being discussed by the utilities, and I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand from being on the phone. Um, so I, I lost that opportunity. But, but I do want to say a couple of things uh, about life cycle savings, and Mr. Voorhees mentioned this. I'm not aware of any jurisdiction that either requires, you know, that has metrics framed in life cycle savings or just requires the reporting. Nobody's going back after the fact. And because the markets change, those life cycle numbers are 
different. I mean, if that was the case, there would also be retroactive changing of annual savings targets, which nobody's doing either. Admittedly, some jurisdictions do retroactively look at net to gross and apply that, but but I think that's different than what was suggested this morning. And maybe it's just a different uh, different experience or different understanding of the terms. But when we talk about life cycle savings, we are not saying that as the markets change, we go back and change the estimates of savings from three years ago. It's the life cycle savings that were calculated at the time the savings are reported. So I, I, so I just kind of want to put aside some of the reasons that the utilities seem to be proposing it should be an annual number because I, I have a different understanding of what life cycle means and I hope that that's clarifying. I, I also wanted to say about that the, when we're talking about net to gross that you know gross are really clear numbers that we can calculate but net numbers are it's a soft number I, I, as Mr. Um, excuse me Dr. McNeil um, said you know I, I think that the the evaluation that we're doing has a lot more rigor to it than that. And I, I think that's a mischaracterization to say it's a soft number. Fair, it's not as precise, perhaps a number as the gross savings, but, um, and there are other issues that can come up with net savings, which is, uh, as Mr. Loper will, if he didn't already when I was off the call, as, as he said before, and we'll say again, you know, you can really split hairs over what the net to gross numbers are and how those studies are conducted, and especially when there's compensation related to that. And we've seen that that's a difficult situation in some states. But it, but it don't, I don't think that's the same as saying, you know, we can't rely on net savings numbers or it's a soft number. And um, so I, I did want to say that. And there probably were some other things I wanted to say about um, the utility conversation, but I, I'm sorry, I don't remember. So anyway enough of me that's that's the proposal we're putting forward here and I, I think there you know in this kind of framework there may be room to incorporate uh, a lot of the aspects of what others have proposed uh, under this framework all right thank you very much sir I, and please next time uh if you're on the phone just just holler just jump in <laughs> okay uh, thanks. anybody else uh on the line because we certainly don't want to exclude anyone and um I, I have no idea how or if you can raise your hand while you're on the phone. So, um, and, and sir, if I if I could just ask you in in the gross versus net discussion, um, are, you seem to be uh, more of a fan of the net, or do you envision both both a gross and and net savings um, measurement? Um, it, I'm not sure what the answer is. You know, as has been said, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. I think um, Mr. Howard said this morning, you know, if we're talking about uh, PIMS, then the, the discussion may become more important. And the, the, you know, what net savings are intended to represent uh, are the influence of the company. So if we're talking about rewarding a utility company for achieving a target, it's pretty important that the things that they did directly led to achievement of that target. And with net savings, that's what that's trying to show. With gross savings, you know, especially, you know, that we could look at um, a lighting program that maybe doesn't have a very high net savings. Maybe in a mature program, and I know there's been a lot of discussion, I don't remember what the, what the net to gross number is now for lighting in Maryland, but let's say the program concludes that 60% of people would have purchased those bulbs anyway. It's still cost effective to do it, even if the net savings are only 40% of the gross savings. But there's a point at which that's no longer the case. And, and maybe earlier than that, a point at which it's not really the best investment of ratepayer funds. So, but if the utility is getting rewarded for the gross savings, that disincentive is not, you know, they're not really dealing with it because they're still gonna potentially earn a reward for as we have sometimes uh, said, shoveling LEDs off the back of a truck. I'm not accusing anyone of that. I just really like saying that. <laughs> All right, thank you, sir. Any uh, comments, questions, concerns? Hi, Jim, this is 
Pearl from Pepco, and I would I would like to have a picture of someone shoveling LEDs off the back of the truck, and I would like to join next time that happens because that sounds like fun. I I did want to talk a little bit more about net to growth though, because when we're looking at our counties, especially have really aggressive standards. And I'm looking at, say, example, for example, Montgomery County, who's adopting pretty strict, strict building performance standards. And the way that we're looking at our energy efficiency programs is that we're supporting that policy. But it becomes really tricky to then call any of those net savings because the standard's already in place. I, I think by that logic, we couldn't implement programs really in Montgomery County because they would all be attributable to the Montgomery County policy and not to our efforts. And I, I, I don't think that's the intended outcome. And I want to hear how you how you reconcile that. Well, uh, I think you're right. And um, it's a conversation that we had uh, <clears throat> a bunch when I was directing residential for Efficiency Vermont because, you know, again, from, from my perspective, you want programs and initiatives to be supporting each other all driving in the same direction. And it doesn't make sense to create a situation where the utility says, ah, we're not gonna help because we don't get any credit for it. So I, I hear you loud and clear on that issue. Um, and it's another one of the reasons why I think the net to gross question is not as clear cut as some other things may be in, in this discussion. Um, you know, I'm not sure what the answer is, but it, but it, but it, but I also think that there is kind of a signal there. I mean, if if without spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on a net to grow study for you know Pepco's efforts in in Montgomery County or or wherever there's other initiatives, if it looked like 90% of what was going to happen was going to happen anyway, then that probably should at least indicate that the utility should be modest in how much they're investing in the support to me because because uh, uh, the rate payers aren't necessarily getting a whole lot out of it. I think it's a tricky question, Pearl. Well, and, and I think there's a little bit of chicken and egg there, right? So I, my, I do not work for Montgomery County, but my expectation is that when they're thinking about these standards, that they're thinking about programs like Empower supporting those efforts happening. So if we're not there supporting them, but there's a standard, you know, would it have happened but for our help with them meeting that standard? And I, that, that's sort of the bind that we, that we see. And we want to be supportive. We view ourselves as partners on these climate goals. And we want to make sure that we are able to be that partner. So I, I, I appreciate that you also see the bind between us wanting to be that partner and seeing the value of our programs towards decarbonization and how that makes it complicated when the net goals are the ones that folks are looking at. Yep, you bet. And, you know, and the answer may be that, I mean, the, the net to gross is not static, you know, so if there's an initiative in Montgomery County that's being launched and, you know, and we're going to, you know, all new construction is going to be net zero and it's not now and PEP goes involved and maybe for five years, there's pretty good net savings. And then, you know, you've helped transform the market. And that's really not so different from other things where federal standards may come in down the road after utility programs have really helped support a change in the market. That might be part of the answer. Uh, Julia, get your hand up. You're, you're muted. Can you guys hear me? We can now. No. Oh, okay. I needed both phone and computer to be unmuted. Um, it's so much technology. Jim, thank you for the uh, outline that you sent around. And I actually think it's really, even though you don't have numbers in there, really helpful to see the language that you're using. Um, so I appreciate that a lot. Um, I mostly just have a question on number two. So the one that has to do with fuel switching. Is that um, is that inclusive of electric vehicles? Um, yes or no? And then I guess more broadly, do you have thoughts on um, you know? I think we've all acknowledged that like if 
beneficial electrification is a part of this. Goals will be needed to be adjusted. Uh, curious if you have any thoughts on like what that looks like. Well, to the first question, thanks, Julia. Um, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Um, I think it, you know, like many things, it really what Mr. Voorhees was saying. I mean, whether if electric vehicles are included, then the the target is different than if they're not included. Um, I think there's room either way. Um, and the second question, I'm sorry, I lost it. Uh, sure, <laughs> just more broadly, yeah, I guess more broadly on um, like accounting for that increase in electric usage. Uh, like, do we, do we know, I guess, do we know what, like, are there projections of like how much we would have to account for um, and things like that? Like what, I guess I'm thinking, just trying to see like, if you could point me to like things about adoption rates of electric vehicles or heat pumps or that sort and sort of like, you know, what does that mean for the goals? But then also, you know, how does that track with the overall like greening of the grid towards carbon free uh, resources? Mm -hmm. I, I see that Cynthia Sordo raised her hand and I was going to say that MDE has done a lot of work um, on these sorts okay. of projections and Cindy might want to speak to that. I'm sorry. Um, I was hoping to hear your answer on that, James. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't consider my ex, uh, myself an expert. Um, um, it's definitely a really interesting question, and I think it's also one of those chicken and egg uh, questions. If we support programs from either the uh, private or public sector in, in different ways, uh, it can drive EVs, um, and um, it's and that's that's part of the that's part of what's going on here, right? Is we don't know what that market is going to look like. It's probably going to involve more EVs, but how much and which ones and what that looks like in terms of infrastructure long term is kind of what's um, an open question right now. But um, one thing that I uh, am wondering for the group is um, that 40% uh, goal uh, for equity of uh, benefits. Um, under the APPRISE report, I believe it was like around 20% of people in Maryland fit under the low income um, definition used. Um, it's um, below the federal poverty level, I believe. So uh, would the 40% of benefits only be going to those low income folks or it should i'm wondering what the definition should be in terms of equity because uh i'm 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 thinking targeting also those middle income folks um could also be a part of the picture in terms of providing benefits and under the chat i had mentioned that uh in my mind supporting workforce development can also be a part of the equity picture. So, um, and there's a, you know, a great history already under Empower of there being um, Maryland-based contractors um, that work well with the utility. So if we can uh, support more of that, I think um, it's also part of the picture. Thanks, Cindy. Um, yeah, thank you for, for all of that. And um, before I talk about the equity number, I'm just going to mention that if, for folks who didn't see it, Chris Hoagland, also from MBE, put some uh, information in the chat about uh, projections. <clears throat> I know we've talked with Chris about the projections for heat pumps and building electrification and how that uh, flows out over the next decade or so, but um, more information there, and uh, Chris is, is definitely the expert there. On the 40% question, it, it's I think it's a really important question that uh, is, it merits a lot of discussion. So both what's the right number and what's included. As for the other things that we've been talking about, you know, how, how big the goal is depends on what counts towards achieving it. When we're talking about equity, utility programs like Empower traditionally have had an income criterion that's used to defer uh, to inform eligibility, and that's 
what counts. So in the past, it's been 200% below families, households rather, below 200% federal poverty level are eligible for low income services through Empower. In some states in Pennsylvania, it's 150%. Maryland has changed it with this current cycle to 250% of federal poverty level. There have been some um, jurisdictions that have looked at other kinds of metrics for defining eligibility you know, within the disadvantaged community pool. There have been some that have looked at um, census data. If, if a community has a high enough percentage of low-income households in it, let's kind of do a blitz on the whole community and try to do some effort to get everybody involved, community-based outreach, and, and we're going to say that counts towards a low-income goal. I think the same thing could be potentially talked about when we're looking at, at predominantly um, communities of color, you know, and especially when there's an overlap with communities of color that are have a high proportion of lower income households. Um, there, are, there are a lot of needs, I think, around you know, how we approach equity. Um, so I, I don't have a specific proposal. I know we're gonna talk about that further in this process. Um, but I do appreciate you raising it, Cindy, because I think it's really merits a lot of important discussion. And I think this is an opportunity to think about it in a more fulsome way than maybe we have in the past. Um, and I'm also going to just say that uh, I believe that um, from the uh, prize data that about 24% of Empower households in whenever that was done, 2018 or so, were uh, below 200% of the federal poverty level. There's some reason to think it might be higher now after the pandemic, but I don't know. That's just a maybe. We know a lot of people lost income. Um, and we also know that now the threshold is 250%. So a lot of discussion to have there. All right. Thank you, sir. I've got a couple of folks with their hands up. We'll go Joe, then Emily. Yes, this is Joe. Uh, so I, I want to go back to the net to gross uh, question, just make a a uh, few observations. Um, uh, first, it's a, uh, or overall, I think net to gross, uh, whether you take net savings or gross savings is in part, can be looked at as a scope question, um, uh, along with whether you're including uh, grid modernization measures or whether you're behind the meter or outside the meter. And basically, if you have a gross savings goal as opposed to a net savings goal, that presumably your goal uh, stringency would be higher. You would have a higher percentage goal than if you do for net. Currently, portfolio-wide, the net to gross is about 60% uh, of the overall portfolio. And for uh, as, as uh, several people have mentioned, for res lighting, it's 20%. And so uh, obviously, you would not want to assume if you're developing a based on potential study and an analytics uh, if you were doing a gross savings goal, it would be much higher than a net savings goal. In terms of the evaluation, I know uh, with specifically with respect to Montgomery County and, and any other government standards, those are typically uh, counted as baseline and uh, in, in evaluations today for gross savings. Uh, and then it gets adjusted, uh, you adjust from that for net savings. Um, if the utilities are claiming uh, something, a, a baseline that is, a baseline energy consumption that is actually lower than the government standard, or higher, the consumption is higher than the government standards, then uh, we would need ha to discuss how that's going to be evaluated in terms of net to gross when we go into our cost effectiveness analysis. And so that's uh, hopefully uh, we always, you know, as part of the evaluation advisory group, try to make those decisions, at least on the methodology that we're going to use, if not the result before you go do the programs or before you at least you get too far down the road so that you're not getting sticker shock or nobody's getting sticker shock on the cost effectiveness side. And so uh, the fact that we try to do as much of that in advance uh, means I would think that if it, if it was a net savings goal, I'm not advocating one or the other, but I'm, if, if, it, if it were a net savings goal, I would think that we would want to be deciding those things in advance in that con, uh, context uh, as well, but we already do it. Um, so the, uh, uh, and I think a couple people have said the net to gross can be applied prospectively. Um, the analysis, you know, even for, uh, and you can project out for res lighting, we predicted actually several years ago, it would go 80% net to gross to 60% to 40 to 20. 
um, and it's right we're right below 20 percent right now and so the even the projections we were making a few years ago uh, are fairly close to what we're uh, getting from the ex post um, evaluations and gross savings uh, I, I agree with Sheldon that uh, that the gross savings have greater level of uncertainty there are certain things that you know you count the number of widgets you multiply by the you know uh, compare the uh, baseline savings to the uh, to the actual savings um, but a lot of the cert you know a few years ago we started uh, really we started locking down the TRM the technical reference manual that's used for gross savings and the reason we started locking down the TRM and all the parameters and measure assumptions that are in the TRM is because we were getting so much uncertainty around gross savings that we would that the utilities were concerned that we would come back we'd have predictions about they they put in their program plans what their expected savings were and then a major parameter assumption would change such as the hours of use associated with lighting and it would dramatically change their gross savings and that was giving people a lot of heartburn and so I, I I just want I just want to let people know that the certainty around gross savings is in part because we make the decisions up front and lock it down, and there's really I'm not sure there's a reason why we couldn't do that for uh, net to gross uh, as well. And finally, I just one observation is that right now gross if you do gross savings, uh, you're basically assuming net to gross equals one for your goal, and. It ha that has a you know that communicates something out to the outside world because most people don't understand the subtleties of gross versus net and so when they see Maryland saving two percent of its uh, you know electric consumption from the Empower programs they don't realize well that really you know a forty percent of that or or six uh, forty percent of that is not coming may not be coming from the programs it's coming from something else. Sorry for the monologue. Thanks, Joe. Judge, can I just? I could oh. jump in. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Megan. I just want to say just one thing, if I remember it. I lost it. Okay, go ahead, Megan. <laughs> sorry, Jim. <laughs> you know, I don't mean to step on your toes. I respect uh, everything I have to say. Um, the the one thing I did want to bring up is going back kind of on this conversation around the the net versus gross question, and especially in the context of uh, Montgomery County's building energy performance standards. Uh, ACEEE last summer uh, issued a white paper looking at the building energy performance or states and cities around the country that are introducing building energy performance standards and compliance requirements. And in in most of those states, I, I want to say almost all of them, there was some met, there was some element of the utility energy efficiency programs being explicitly stated as something that was in support of those standards. And in Washington state and in Missouri in particular, there was actually an exemption that was built into um, the, those, those regulations, those legisla the legislation that explicitly created an exemption for ener utility energy efficiency programs that were directly in support of those building energy performance standards. And it basically allowed to socialize the cost of non-compliant buildings coming into compliance across the population, recognizing that the, the societal benefits aren't exclusive, that aren't directly or exclusively um, the purview of, of the uh, each building owner. Um, also, building standards tend to be about the building, not the, uh, the customer who's necessarily paying the energy bills, ironically. but. But the second thing that I think is really important worth noting here is just that, you know, if you think about discrete jurisdictions, if they're introducing these building energy performance standards, you know, we, we have a state level policy and we have, and that, you know, is applying to all rate payers, all rate payers are paying into the Empower Maryland Fund, but by putting these standards in a place, if we don't allow the utility programs to support it, then you have a population of customers that are gonna have fewer opportunities to participate, but are being expected to pay in at the same rate as other folks. Yes, that there is a decision on the part of the legislature, but there is necessarily an impact on what, what direct benefits customers are gonna be able to realize through the Empowerment Island programs. And so I just wanted to bring those two pieces to light because um, I think it's a really important distinction um, obviously, it's a subset of the net versus gross discussion, but I think it's going to become increasingly important, and it's certainly something that's really important, you know, in other jurisdictions, like you know, just looking across the border in DC. Um, so, uh, that's all. Me. Can I can I provide the evaluation perspective on that, or at least how we've talked about it for, uh, to date? 
Um, so uh, I don't think there's any aversion uh, from the evaluator side to uh, uh, evaluating savings uh, where utilities are participating or contributing uh, to uh, building code compliance or even building code adoption and development. Maryland is a little challenged on the on the adoption side in terms of giving saving crediting savings to the utilities. It's uh, a little harder in Maryland since uh, Maryland has long had for decades a policy that automatically adopts the national uh, energy code uh, within like 18 months or something of when it when it's uh, uh, determined quote unquote by the uh, by DOE. But on the compliance side, where there is uh, a lack of full compliance in Maryland and the Maryland utilities are contributing to uh, increasing that compliance. I don't, I haven't heard anyone ever argue that we should not try to count that. So. I agree. I mean, we talk about it in a lot of different jurisdictions that there, there's code and there's reality. And if the, if you do a, a market study and see what, what is the level of compliance and if it's not a hundred percent, there is savings between what's actually happening and uh, hundred percent compliant. But again, to also, I was going to say, and people have now said Montgomery County standard, so I know it's standards. So I was going to say it's, it's different if it's a, you know, a, a standard that they are attempting to enforce or, you know, requiring as a permit condition versus, you know, kind of an aspirational goal that they may have. Um, but if it's a standard, depending on how stringent it is, and again, if it's net zero, then I'm not sure how much farther than that you can go. But what, how we've all, uh, again approached it in Vermont was, well, okay, so there's not much savings by getting people to comply with the law, but if we can drive them to be 10% more efficient than the code minimum, then those are savings that are legitimate. And we can do that in every territory, not just in, you know, we can't say, we don't have to just say in Montgomery County, you have to be 10% more efficient and the rest of the state, you only just have to, you know, be at a lower level. Um, so try to drive that higher efficiency everywhere. But again, if it's net zero, then that may be a move. Thank you, sir. Uh, Emily. Hi, Jim. Um, I'm going to switch gears off the net versus gross topic, if that's okay. Um, I appreciated the proposal here it was really interesting to kind of see the roll up to an overall greenhouse gas savings approach um, and i particularly was interested in the 40 percent of the benefits piece kind of returning to that topic um, we've also noted that that seems to be taking root in new york and at the federal level um, you talked about kind of the challenges around determining who um, you know, who counts? Is it just low income or communities of color, frontline communities? But I was also wondering what your thoughts are in terms of what counts as the benefit? Like, is it simply the, you know, benefits from the cost effectiveness test? Or is there some other rubric? Or have, I, I'm guessing you might say we, let's discuss. <laughs> but I think that's an, a really active issue sort of topic of conversation in a lot of places and would be a key piece of understanding this, that target. I couldn't agree more. Um, I mean, we could, we could just say, you know, across all of Empower, we're only measuring megawatt hour savings. And so it's 40% of the megawatt hours. But um, we also, as, as you do, um, argue that there are a lot of benefits that flow from energy efficiency work and beneficial electrification that are, you know, often not measured um, it makes sense to i think do a more fulsome accounting of what those benefits are um, but you know that that may change the is whether 40 percent is the right number or not I, I, yeah so, i think yeah discussion that would certainly bear in and and if i could while i have the floor the other um i just wanted to insert this as a maybe a more general comment. Um, I was intrigued by the inclusion of number four, the placeholder for um, CO2 equivalent savings from other <laughs> innovative solutions. And I, I do, um, you know, we're often looking for ways to encourage innovation. 
I particularly wanted to note um, refrigerants uh -huh. and reduced um, refrigerant emissions, HFC emissions as an area that might be worth paying attention to. This um, likely applies more to the CNI sector. So this isn't necessarily something OPC is going to focus on extensively in our comments, but um, there are some precedents emerging. Um, Efficiency Vermont is one where they've actually been able to characterize the greenhouse gas savings from refrigerant management, which also has very high um, energy savings. So that's an activity that has both a standard efficiency benefit, but has this auxiliary benefit because those are incredibly potent greenhouse gases. Um, not only refrigerant management, but re you know, replacing refrigerants with low, low greenhouse gas potential or low global warming potential um, alternatives and natural refrigerants. So that's an area of work that's kind of not often discussed and has a, a really natural synergy with the efficiency programs um, that I would just encourage consideration to see if there might be a way that could fit in um, into the framework. Great point. Thank you. Uh, sir, there was there was one question I had, and I know you um, may have dropped off before, but when we had the utilities um, presenting, there was uh, some discussion about what should count towards um, you know satisfying the empower goals. Uh, it, should it be uh, behind them anything that's behind the meter? It should also things be outside the meter that count towards that goal. Um, and I, I don't know if this was a good idea or not, and maybe I'll regret raising it, um, whether or not there should be like, maybe like a two-tiered goal that measures both of those. I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on that, sir? Um, I, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I, I don't personally at, at this moment have a strong sense of what all of the potential for uh, on the utility side of the meter activities might be. Um, and I think that, uh, not speaking for Mr. Voorhees, but one of the, but one of the reasons that, that, in fact, that is one of the reasons that I would be a little nervous about just saying, yeah, well, let's include everything because we don't, we don't, I can't picture what it would be and what it would do to the portfolio. And the, the bullet number four, where I have some no more than percentage of innovative solutions. I was thinking that that would be a place for the utilities to develop some of those on the other side of the meter solutions um, without having uh, others fear that, you know, that something is gonna come up that might look good towards the goals, but that might then deprioritize all these other activities that we think are still important. Does that make any sense? It, it it does. So, are you are you saying you're? Uh, it sounds like you're a bigger fan of counting just what's behind the meter, and what's kind of directly funded by Empower. Yes, but you're but, not you're not opposed to uh, new and in, new innovations or possibly existing programs that also support uh, Empower. Correct. I, 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 so I would say that. Uh, the, the first three bullets and most of the fifth bullet would be on the customer side of the meter in my view of the world. And, but in that fourth bullet that allows the innovative solutions, some of that might be on the, on the utility side of the meter. And, uh, you know, if that occurs within a three year plan cycle, um, then there's a bunch of new information, hopefully that might inform what the metrics are, or, or you know, in the next cycle. That's, that's a, a, your question. Um, Scott, I'll come to you in just a second. Um, the three-year cycle you referenced, um, the utilities have kind of thrown out there maybe a longer cycle, possibly four to five years. Uh, do you have a have a wag on that one way or the other? Uh, I personally prefer a three-year cycle. I, I don't think uh, we've, we've had three-year cycles for a bunch of years now, and I don't think that has limited the ability of the utilities to do longer term planning for the programs. I mean, if there's assurance that there is going to be a next three year cycle, which I would strongly support, I, I think it's entirely, I, I think that should be sufficient for the utilities to be able to do longer term planning for the programs and how they're going to approach them. Um, if, 
you know, we, we used to do one year cycles in a bunch of jurisdictions. You know, you do one year plan and then you don't know whether anything's going to get approved at the end of that year. That makes it really hard to plan or to do the kinds of initiatives that have long lasting market impacts. But I think three year cycles with the expectation that there will be subsequent cycle is, is sufficient. And, you know, over four or five years, a lot of things can change. And I understand that utilities could come in and uh, request changes and, and that they have done sometimes. Um, but, it, but I think it's, I think three years is the sweet spot for not, re not requiring insane amounts of replanning and new, new plan development all the time, um, but also recognizing that things are changing constantly. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Scott. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to, I'm actually glad you brought it up because I, I had a coworker remind me that um, that uh, the Empower program is a significant tool used by the state to, you know, for the greenhouse gas emissions plan and for the state's goals for doing that. And um, it, it's, it leverages a lot of other resources to help achieve those goals. And so if that truly is, you know, where the greenhouse gas plan comes from and, and they see Empower that way, um, then it, it does seem as though, you know, the utilities approach of allowing, you know, measures or efficiencies on on either side of the meter would be appropriate. Um, so I just want to put that out there again, you know, not a position, just information. And I don't know if that's completely accurate, but um, if it is in it, then it might help lead us in the in a direction. Thanks, Scott. Um, I, I for one appreciate that. Um, anybody have any comments on that or want to weigh in on whether or not that's correct? The, the only thing I would say, if I may, is, you know, on this discussion of the potential for activities on the utility side of the meter, um, I would certainly like to have a much better understanding before, well, I would like to have a better understanding even be, before saying I disagree with that. You know, I, I, what are we talking about? What's the scale? What's the scope? How, how do you look at it? How do you do cost benefit? Um, you know, what are the customer costs, how, how, all kinds of stuff about it. Cause I don't personally, I don't actually know what it is. Okay. Fair question, sir. Um, why don't we, before we delve back into that, maybe we can go through, does anybody else have any questions for Mr. Gravatt? And hopefully, sir, if we have, uh, some time at the end, maybe we can have the utilities kind of give us, um, uh, an outside the meter 101 as, as as to what exactly they're talking about, what's included, uh, things of that nature. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Um, do we have anyone from a building, building performance association? Yes. Hi, um, this is Sabine Rogers here uh, representing the building mm -hmm. performance association. Um, so my colleague, Kara Sol Rinaldi presented at the last meeting um, and similar to OPC, uh, the document we submitted yesterday isn't necessarily a new proposal, um, but we did want to provide some additional specificity uh, to the original proposals that we had submitted. Um, many of the details that are in the document are things that uh, Kara had already discussed at the meeting a couple weeks ago. Um, but we did want to you know, provide that recap again for this group um, and share the written copy as well. Um, so I'll keep my comments relatively brief, uh, but certainly welcome, you know, questions and look forward to additional discussion um, with this group. Um, just to start off, so I'm not getting too far ahead of myself for everyone on the call, um, BPA, the Building Performance Association, is a national industry association representing contractors across the country, um, primarily in the home performance space. Um, and we have many uh, who do work, uh, including through the Empower program in the state of Maryland. Um, and as an association, we're committed to strengthening the home performance industry um, and, you know, not only delivering improved efficiency in health and environmental performance of buildings, but also advancing efficiency as a vehicle for expanding the clean energy workforce and creating those quality local jobs as well. So the first thing I actually wanted to raise was just um, uh, building off of something Cindy said earlier, I think uh, with MDE, she raised a great point that uh, supporting workforce 
um, is a key issue in terms of uh, ensuring the success of these programs. Um, it's a top priority for BPA as well and uh, while not specifically included in our proposal on the new goal structure, um, it's definitely something that we'd like to you know, discuss more on how it fits into all of these plannings. Um, additionally, I just would like to say for the record that we agree with a, a lot of all the other conversation uh, that's been said already, so I don't wanna belabor the point, but on the importance of equity and uh, looking forward to kind of going deeper into that discussion as well when we reach the low income part of these conversations. Um, and just in general, uh, reiterating uh, what other folks have said as well about the importance of alignment with state policy goals. Um, and to that point, um, you know, as we look at climate goals and what others have said about how Empower fits into the state's greenhouse gas reduction um, targets, you know, Empower is becoming only more and more important and the role for efficiency, but also demand flexibility and peak demand reductions um, is, is just ever growing in the context of reaching those goals. Um, so that brings me to the first piece of our proposal, which is um, in the context of aligning with state policy goals, uh, creating fuel neutral goals, um, either through a greenhouse gas reduction goal or an MMBTU goal. Um, and what we shared in the proposal document yesterday is uh, closely um, aligned with what NEEA shared in terms of looking at an overarching goal. Um, but the key piece that we also wanna to add to that conversation is um, thinking about providing fuel neutral incentives uh, for building shell measures. And this is something that was brought up earlier as well. Um, but looking at between electricity and natural gas homes, how the Home Performance with Energy Star program runs currently, uh, there is a disparity in the level of incentives and we've seen um, a real challenge and this comes back to the equity issue of things where um, folks living in uh, homes with natural gas heat don't have the same access uh, to incentives to do weatherization you know insulation air sealing things that would help them you know lower their energy burden um, and provide uh, significant um, you know benefits uh, using those ratepayer costs um, using those ratepayer funds. So I can go into more detail on that, but that's just one of the key um, pieces we wanted to add to the conversation about fuel neutral goals. Um, the next piece we highlighted in the proposal document we shared yesterday is uh, the importance of tracking health and safety benefits. Um, and this is something I think will come into more play when we focus on the cost effectiveness testing specifically. Um, but very much in line with what OPC um, and Emily presented, um, uh, being able to better understand the health impacts of energy efficiency projects and interventions, um, including you know, improvements in indoor air quality, um, how that relates to whether it's you know, someone in the home who has asthma um, and how that then can reduce healthcare utilization and the costs associated with that. Um, so having a better understanding of essentially quantifying what the impacts um, of participant, participant health uh, improvements, um, including customer comfort kind of in the long scope of, of what is health. <laughs> um, so we included a couple different uh, reports in the proposal I submitted yesterday, um, which includes a report from ACEEE on braiding energy and health funding. Um, for in-home programs, and also a recent report from the Roosevelt Institute, um, which focuses on how economic recovery begins at home, but specifically includes um, a recommendation on linking Medicaid resources uh, to healthy homes retrofits that are focused on energy efficiency as well. Um, finally, I wanted to circle back to cost effectiveness, which has been brought up a number of times, I know in this conversation, um, Dan Hurley had mentioned uh, at the outset um, or had posed a question, I guess, about how will questions of climate and energy efficiency and low income targets um, kind of be factored into cost effectiveness testing. Um, and Emily had also noted earlier that, you know, there is a lot of activity going on uh, in other places and thinking about how the Empower program um, is coordinated with those activities and, uh, you know, where, their align where alignment uh, can be ensured. So in all of that context, um, we just want to reiterate that it is important that there's consistent cost effectiveness principles um, and methodologies across all DER types in the state. So as we're looking at efficiency, um, you know, also behind the meter storage, EVs, et cetera, 
Um, and that's really key so that there is a level playing field and that the state is you know, comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges and how, uh, how they're looking at the different costs and benefits and what's included in a test. Um, the risk of not doing that is that utilities might overinvest in some DER types and underinvest in others, um, just because of how uh, the different testing methodologies, you know, prioritize um, or you know, include certain benefits or certain assumptions uh, in some places but not others. Um, so that to that point, we just wanted to note uh, for this group that there is. Um, work currently underway to review the National Standard Practice Manual for DERs through the EV work group. Specifically, they have a BCA subgroup um, that's actually convening tomorrow. Um, and so we just want to you know, highlight the importance of um, working to kind of break down some of the silos and um, perhaps thinking about ways to coordinate with the efforts underway in that group um, and bringing that discussion into our um, group's discussion on cost effectiveness testing to ensure the consistency again across all DERs. Um, so all that said, um, you know, knowing that there will be a lot further discussion down the road, I don't want to belabor the point uh, too much in this conversation, um, but we do think, you know, in the context of a new goal structure, establishing a commitment to undertake the process outlined and the guidance um, outlined in the National Standard Practice Manual um, is important to ensure that there is, um, you know, consistency and we're taking into account, you know, how Maryland's test uh, can be aligned and can consider all of the priorities that we're talking about, including the new goal structure that's being developed. Um, so that's where I'll end it, but certainly welcome any questions um, and, and look forward to additional discussion. Uh, thank you, ma'am. One question I had for you, you under the health and safety benefits, uh, the tracking metrics, how would you envision that uh, information be tracked? Just, uh, I'm just curious. Yeah, so we don't have, you know, a specific, it's not like not a set in stone kind of position or proposal, but I think the key piece being that it's important um, to be thinking about um, have, having specific data and metrics um, to inform the benefits that we're trying to better understand, particularly in the context of cost effectiveness testing. Um, so for example, um, I didn't actually cite it in this most recent proposal, but uh, VEIC I know has a, a great report on um, healthy homes. I uh, maybe uh, Emily can jump in and, and correct me if I'm, I'm misciting this, but essentially, uh, energy plus health and how uh, you can combine, um, you know, work that's done in the home that addresses, for example, asthma um, and, and combining that with an in-home home performance, um, you know, energy audit, and then uh, addressing indoor air quality through home performance improvements, and then being able to then assess the indoor air quality after the fact. So that's one example um, that I can point to off the top of my head of, you know, tracking how uh, home performance projects can improve indoor air quality, for example. Um, but VEIC does have a great report and I can see if I can find the link to that as well, if that's helpful. I just posted it, Sabine. Oh, thank you, Emily. <laughs> I hope I didn't much. butcher the name too much. Not at all, you're great. Thank you, ma'am. Any uh, questions, comments? concerns over uh, BPA's um, proposals. Once, twice. All right. Thank you very much, ma'am. Oh, wait, no. I, All right. I, Emily's got a sorry, question. I didn't, I didn't quite get there in time, but um, you mentioned Sabine workforce at the beginning, and I just I thought that might merit a little bit more attention because we haven't really been focused on that and nobody has actually proposed, a, at least that I recall, a, a specific metric related to workforce development or contractor engagement or anything along those lines. But um, we've been increasingly just, I mean, as you as you well know, you know, we are we work in all these different states and in every state there are these massive shortages and um, utilities and programs are having trouble 
finding contractors to do this work. And now hopefully if there's an additional focus at the federal level that might bring more resources into our industry, but we, you know, the workforce hasn't kept up. So I, this seems to be a really, potentially a really key issue and limiting factor for the success of programs. Um, I'm not as familiar with the market in Maryland specifically, but I assume that national trend is also bearing out in Maryland. So I guess I'm just curious for your thoughts on, you know, if we're not proposing a goal around this, is is there something that this group should be thinking about now in terms of ensuring there's a um, you know sufficient level of support for workforce development activities, just given the importance of that issue? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I'm glad you highlighted it. So BPA hasn't specifically thought about um, or you know come up with a position on a goal to kind of track efforts to support workforce, um, but I do think. Um, if we can like put a pin in it, I think it's a really important part of the conversation for exactly the reasons you stated of, you know, an essential part of the implementation will be the contractors who have the training necessary uh, to, to do the work properly, right? And um, absolutely agree that there's a federal component to that, but looking at also the role for, um, I think, utility program engagement um, with contractors as well. So I guess my response would be, would love to continue the conversation and, and think about how we can marry the, the goal structure with um, you know, support for workforce, um, in particular training and, um, you know, and, and other obstacles that we've seen um, in the state. And we can maybe, uh, you know, share some of the insights and questions, uh, bring them back to contractors in the state that we do represent and kind of uh, see if we can provide some of their feedback to this conversation as well. So thank you for bringing that up. Sure, and I Did also, um, I, I just, I'll, I'll turn it over to Pearl in a second. I was just gonna note um, Cindy's prior comment in the, the chat earlier in the, the meeting, she mentioned that equity considerations can include supporting and power connected contractors. So just the diversity mm -hmm. and equity component of workforce engagement too is I think another important angle that the group could consider. So That's just point. You know, first, you know, Emily, thank you so much for flattering me and confusing me with Pearl, but yeah, she's way smarter than me. So I'll disappoint you all. Um, but on the workforce development front piece, you know, I think it's a really an important thing to note and to track. And obviously, you know, we've had components of, of evaluating the support to the workforce. Uh, we, you know, we report out on our, our abilities, um, maintain other initiatives around workforce development, you know, whether it's specifically around jobs, um, you know, working for the utility directly or, or indirectly. But I do worry that if we if we make um, you know if if we start introducing goals that are are really are adjacent to the to the purpose that it, we possibly run the risk of diluting the efforts. And I think that the economic uplift and the workforce development benefits that we that we see and that you know are necessary to support the programs are, those are all great positives and things that merit attention on an ongoing basis. Um, but I think from the context specifically of determining the goal structure, um, you know, I, I don't know that that, I, I worry that that's not necessarily the, the primary purpose of what Empower Maryland is, is set to do. Um, and, you know, if we're gonna narrow the scope to only a handful of really key metrics that, you know, ensure that these programs are, you know, addressing uh, climate change issues and addressing equity from and from a climate justice standpoint. Um, I, I do think it, we we should we should be very thoughtful about what we believe Empower's primary goal is, and to not just introduce goals because, you know. You know, I don't think we want to just, it's, you know, we're not just going to a grocery store and going down the aisle and just picking up things. Like, I don't want it to be an impulse purchase, I guess. Um, so I'll pause there. All right. Thanks, Megan. Um, we've got a couple people with their hands up. Emily, I, I, I can come back to you. Um, we got Kitson and then Brian. 
afternoon again, everyone. Kitson McNeil, MEA. Just a quick follow-up question on the um, proposal. Um, I guess, could BPA please speak to how, um, I guess, the interagency operation in other states work with um, the increased potentially health benefits um, being incorporated into energy, energy efficiency programs? Or how do you envision that working um, here in, in Maryland? Uh, just, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the question, Kitson. So I would actually refer back to that Energy Plus Health um, VEIC study, uh, just because my own expertise is way uh, outshadowed and uh, um, they have a much more extensive report of some of the work being done in other states. Uh, so I think Emily did link to that in the comments. Um, so that would be my answer. <laughs> All right, thank you. Brian? Hi, folks. This is Brian Howard from ECEEE. I just wanted to flag uh, some resources that we've done or that we've produced as it relates to workforce development programs. Um, uh, I'll, I'll forward that to the folks in the link. I'm not aware of any of those programs that, that have been referenced in that study have any relation to, you know, a, a meeting of a, a specific uh, goal for, for PUC activities, but it certainly uh, you know, the interconnection of trying to raise or increase standards uh, for clean energy or efficiency activities is, is linked to that process. Um, I also don't want to put um, uh, folks uh, from uh, Maryland Department of Environment on the, the spot, but you know, I know that there has been some um, activity as it relates to contemplating workforce development enhancements as part of uh, you know, some of the uh, overall Climate Change Commission reports. And so, you know, I think however, uh, the group is going to consider working on on that activity that so we should at least make sure to be synced with what um uh, the department of environment is contemplating in that area as well so, thanks thank you sir uh cindy i wanted to make a quick note on the proposal submitted um by the building performance association just um just almost stating the obvious, um, but the beautiful thing about energy efficiency programs is that it does promote health and safety benefits. Um, but that conversation in terms of like tracking it and incorporating into the cost effectiveness test, I believe is new. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know the full history and the full methodology. And I believe, you know, there are handbooks that are constantly being updated. And um, I believe it varies by state. But um, I'm just stating the obvious that it, it really is a, a beautiful piece of the Maryland Empower program um, that people don't probably don't talk about enough as it is. Um, the other question, uh, that was a comment. One question I have is whether um, whether uh, the building industry is discussing um, like training internally uh, regarding either LEED certification or uh, you know or just like uh, green concepts, um, climate change 101, or or learning more about insurance. Uh, uh, availability, uh, you know, flooding is going to be a big concern in the future. Um, as someone who has seen a lot, uh, a lot of flooding in my life, uh, I'm concerned about that. I know Baltimore and Annapolis and Ellicott City are concerned about that as well. So um, I guess that's another, that's, you know, that's a bit separate, right? But uh, the consideration of uh, risk um, into the future um, is, and then promoting uh, best practices, whether it's lead, uh, water conservation, that kind of thing. I'm wondering if those conversations are occurring. Thanks, Cindy, so much. So I'll actually respond uh, to both points. So first, just circling back on the health and safety benefits. Um, again, not trying to step too far out of the bounds of the goal structure and in, in into cost effectiveness testing, um, but just for background, kind of, Part of where that comes from is uh, from the National Standard Practice Manual, which has um, best practices and, and principles to kind of create an economically sound um, test that is, you know, balanced in terms of 
being symmetrical in terms of what costs and benefits are included. Um, so one of the challenges we do see is when participant costs are included in the test, um, but then not all of the participant benefits are accounted for. Um, and so to that point, um, health and safety um, can be one, and, and even comfort can be substantial benefits uh, for the folks receiving home performance and efficiency um, upgrades. And so not accounting for those can create this asymmetry um, and create an unbalanced test. So that's part of the conversation. Um, and the National Standard Practice Manual doesn't um, say, doesn't give one specific way to do a test, but provides uh, kind of a step-by-step -step process to test the state's test and to identify, you know, where it's, um, where it could do better and whether it's aligning properly with the state, um, you know, policy objectives that are guiding all of these things, um, whether it's symmetrical, et cetera. And then it does also provide guidance on how to kind of come up with ways to quantify those benefits as well. So that's why we wanted to just highlight the manual as a process to undergo and to be looking at um, as we have these conversations. So thank you for bringing that piece up. And then on the training aspect, I don't know if I can answer all parts of your question, um, but certainly BPA uh, does a lot of work around um, uh, training and uh, providing ongoing education to contractors. Uh, this is a, a bit outside of the scope of Maryland, um, but on a national level, we do have um, you know, conferences that are part of that ongoing education, but also are doing a lot of work um, and hoping to support additional funding for contractors to have on the job training um, to be able to support the small businesses that do this important work in investing in new employees, uh, training new hires, et cetera. So I hope that partially answers your question, but I know yours was, was broader than that as well. Yes, thank you so much. And I know these conversations are ongoing and um, our state efforts are connected with national efforts. So it's a two-way street. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, this is Philip from OPC. I had a question for Brian from ACEEE. The ACEEE published a um, clean energy scorecard for all the cities, I guess, main cities in the United States. And I noted that there were five metrics and utilities was only one of the five metri metrics and in fact had a low point. It was 15% of the uh, total calculation was based on utilities. And I'm wondering what, uh, and there was a wide range of high scoring utilities to lower scoring utilities. What affected their, um, the number of points they achieved in that? and is clean energy really a much bigger picture? Uh, other metrics were transportation policy, building policies, community-wide initiatives, and I think local government. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, yeah, to respond, this is Brian from ACEEE. Um, I would need to go back to the methodology because we did change some of that um, from the last two years. Um, you know, certainly a lot of the uh, utility apparatus that I think is contemplated in that looks to, you know, the dynamic between uh, states and, or, you know, the uh, jurisdictional issues around whether uh, those local governments either have, um, you know, uh, municipally run utilities or what their interplay is from, from a state perspective, which is why I assume that the weighting is different versus in our uh, state scorecard, you know, the, a very significant amount of the points that we allocate towards um, the efficiency evaluation of state programs is in the utility sector. So I think a lot of it is some of the jurisdictional things, but I, I can follow up on that specifically and get back with you. Yeah, it seems that the highest number of points were allotted to transportation policy, which was 30%, and building policy yeah. was also 30%. And I'm wondering if we're, well, I, I'm sure someone else in the state is meeting at this very moment trying to solve the other <laughs> the other issues, but um, just trying to get a sense yeah, of where I, we I fit I, into the picture. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would think from this, uh, the city versus state weightings is a little different. I mean, you know, again, our the the work that we've done historically on on the state level analysis, which is you know probably uh, 
you know, again, more analogous to what we'd be doing in this discussion is, you know, uh, is pretty heavily weighted towards the utility sector. But, um, you know, in terms of, I think, Maryland factors more specifically, just again, anecdotally, um, you know, buildings account for the highest energy sector use in the state. And then I think transportation is right behind it. So, um, you know, obviously uh, power generation supports and facilitates a number of those issues. So how we, you know, get to some of those additional ancillary benefits, but, um, you know, it's, it's certainly something to think about. But again, I'm, I'm uh, maybe <laughs> drifting a little off topic, but I, I hope that's at least responsive to your question, but I can get a little more detail for you. Uh, yes, it is. Thank you, Brian. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, anything else for BPA? All right, let's move on to uh, the Clean Energy Group. Anyone uh, on the line from there? From yes. There? Yes, hi, this is Todd Olinsky, Paul. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, loud and clear. Okay. Um, well, I yes, so thank you for letting me uh, uh, address your your. Uh, meeting. I I have a few slides, but I am aware that I think I'm the last uh, person on the menu here, and I, I want to be respectful of the time constraints if there are any. Sir, sir, you take your time. There's no real constraints. I think most folks are working from home, and uh, even if we have uh, some time, we're, we're, take your time, sir. I want to I wanna see your presentation, um, and we've got things that I'd like to follow up with after you, so don't don't feel rushed. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can figure out how to share um, share my screen here. There should be a button down on the bottom. It says present now with a little box and an arrow. Yep, yep, I got that. I'm just looking for the right uh, right thing to share here. Second. Anybody have any uh, suggestions on making this work? I'm trying to uh, share a. Yeah, this is uh, Dan Rowling with the staff. If you click on present now, then I think it should give you a choice of what screen you want to share. Then you need to click on that screen to share, and it hopefully should pop up on the. Uh, on the on the webcast. Do I need to? Yeah, it's not. So let me just uh, try one thing here. Ah, here we go. Can, are you uh, are you seeing this? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, it's coming up. Yeah, we got it now. You have a, a slide that says connected solutions program model. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Sorry about the the delay. Um, so yeah, I, uh, let me just do a little brief background since this is the first time I've um, I've joined this this uh, group and. Um, and I'll try to make this as, as succinct as possible. So uh, I'm Todd Linsky paul I'm a uh, senior project director with the Clean Energy Group and Clean Energy States Alliance. We're a nonprofit located in Vermont. Um, and uh, we're largely foundation funded. We're, uh, we do a lot of clean energy policy and program development support for state agencies. And we, we run something called the Clean Energy States Alliance, which uh, it's sort of like a membership organization for state energy offices. In fact, MEA is a member, as are many other state uh, energy uh, funds and, and agencies. And the, I had submitted uh, uh, a, a brief sort of pro uh, program proposal and an attached report. And I just want to touch on some points. It's a very long report, and I don't expect anyone has taken uh, has had the time to, to really look at it. Um, but I wanted to kind of hit the highlights of this um, 
this program model called Connected Solutions. This was uh, something that was originated in Massachusetts and has spread uh, to other states, uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut, and uh, is proposed in New Hampshire. And it, it's basically a, a customer battery funding mechanism that's run through state energy efficiency programs. And this is why I'm uh, bringing this to your attention. I, I thought it would be a useful model uh, for uh, folks to look at in Maryland. Um, the, the underlying sort of uh, program goal is to allow utilities to form virtual power plants. And I, I, I see from some of the comments that have already uh, occurred in the meeting that that's, that's not a new concept, so I won't belabor that point. But um, basically, it allows uh, residential and commercial customers to uh, either purchase or lease a battery, install it behind their meter, and then sign a multi-year contract with their utility. Um, in order to allow the utility to aggregate and dispatch these behind the meter resources at peak demand hours in order to address uh, the costly uh, peak hours in the year. And then during the other times when it's, when it's off peak, of course, the customer has use of that battery for whatever other purpose they might have, be it uh, resilience, backup power, or uh, integrating solar, for example, or, or, or whatever else they might need it for. Uh, and then the customers get paid under this model uh, based on performance. So it's a pay for performance. It's not strictly speaking an incentive model. Uh, utilities are only paying for the service they receive. Um, and by sort of using this aggregated distributed uh, battery model to address regional peaks, it saves money for, for the ratepayers at large. So the, the key elements of this model, as I said, it's run through the state energy efficiency program. Um, uh, customers own or lease the batteries. Uh, aggregators and you know, third-party developers can also participate, as at least in, in New England, as it's being uh, administered presently. We have uh, developers like uh, Sunrun, for example, that can enroll that market program and to their customers and enroll those customers into the utilities uh, connected solutions program. And that's something that's typically um, more of interest to the commercial customers because it's helpful to them to have a third party aggregator uh, to help them get the th whole program set up, size the batteries and so forth. But you can do it either way. Uh, you can just leave out the middleman and contract directly with the utility. Um, as I said, the, the batteries are addressing system-wide demand peaks, not individual uh, home or commercial facility peaks. And so it's different from a demand charge management sort of model where you're just addressing an individual facility peak. In this model, you're really benefiting everybody because you're addressing a regional system-wide peak. Um, Participants are compensated for both load reduction and power export. And this is where it differs from a more typical demand response kind of program, which is usually based on just load reduction and benchmarking. In this model, uh, you can reduce your load down to zero, but then you can then export the, whatever remaining power might be in the battery. Again, this is only on a utility signal, so there's no uh, concern at the utility from the utilities point of view of having people export power during uh, you know unopportune moments it's really uh, just during those peak hours and um, it, one of the benefits here is that all customers can participate so we, if you compare this for example to demand charge management which is really only available to commercial customers who have a peaky load pay a high demand charge etc this kind of this model really democratizes uh, energy storage in the sense that any customer, residential, commercial, no matter what their tariff is or what kind of load they have, can participate through this uh, program, which is housed in the efficiency plan of the state. And, um, and through this kind of uh, democratization, it really is uh, easy to make this available for low income communities and underserved communities by including equity provisions. Um, and, and there have been a lot of these kinds of things proposed, for example, in Connecticut right now, there's a straw proposal out 
uh, from Pura, who is the regulator in that state, uh, that would include not only performance payments, but an upfront rebate, and they have an adder for low-income customers to participate and uh, on bill payment and all kinds of uh, you know, low, uh, low interest financing, et cetera. Uh, I also want to point out that this uh, feature whereby the customer has a multiple year contract for this uh, performance payment tends to de-risk storage investment. In other words, um, if, you're, if you're an investor, energy storage sometimes looks a little risky based on, for example, a demand charge management model because you're relying on the storage owner to correctly predict their individual peak. And if they miss it, then they're not getting the cost savings benefit. On, in this model, you're really just responding to a utility signal. And because it's a multi-year contract, you can predict uh, what your revenue stream is going to look like. In Massachusetts, it's a five-year contract. So you have a five-year uh, predictable revenue stream through that contract. And that makes it much easier to get uh, investment, especially in um, you know, underserved communities where financing can be difficult. So uh, this I won't belabor because I think it's pretty well understood probably, uh, but traditional efficiency um, is, sort of, is, you know, sort of broadly def defined as using fewer electrons. Uh, batteries are a little different. They don't necessarily no lower the net consumption, but they shift it from a, from a, from a peak period to an off-peak period, and this creates efficiencies. Uh, the the chart in the lower left here is from a report um, in that was conducted in Massachusetts that found that 40% of the annual cost of the entire uh, system for electricity was attributable to the top 10% peak demand hours each year. So that indicates that the, these peaks are incredibly expensive, and because the whole system is designed to meet and sized to meet the peak, you have these periods where there's a lot of idle capacity during off-peak times, and that's represented in this chart by the white space, which is really inefficiencies in the system. Uh, ideally, you'd like to flatten out that load curve, bring down the peaks, uh, raise the valleys, and, and be able to, uh, you know, not oversize the whole system to that degree, and that and that's really where we're going with this kind of approach. So the key concept here is that not all load hours should be valued the same, and in fact they're not, as we can see from things like demand charges and time of use rates. So this this really capitalizes on the ability of storage to shift uh, from from those high value to low value periods for uh, for load. Uh, this isn't something that's that's sort of off in the future. It's the, these these programs are being operated now. I mentioned Massachusetts. The program went into effect in January 2019, so we're nearing the end of the initial three-year period. Um, I'm expecting this to be expanded in the coming three-year efficiency plan. There, uh, it became effective in Rhode Island in January of 2020, uh, and also going to be expanded. Uh, was expanded for this year. Um, Connecticut, there's a nine-year uh, straw proposal, uh, to, and they, they want to achieve a 580 megawatts of behind-the-meter storage through this nine-year program, again, modeled on this Massachusetts Connected Solutions program. Uh, there are also similar programs being run by utilities outside of state efficiency programs. So, for example, here in Vermont, Green Mountain Power has 3,000 customers enrolled in their uh, customer battery programs. Uh, and this is being done in other states as well. It's been very uh, effective as far as we can tell. There hasn't been a whole lot of public reporting, but Navigant Consulting, which is now known as Guidehouse, um, published some early results looking at national grid territory in Massachusetts. Uh, they found that, and this, is, this result is based on a residential customer participation only. Uh, they found that of the residential customers that had enrolled at that point, 94% uh, never opted out of an event, and they can opt out if they choose to. Um, and 97% said they'd recommend the program to other customers and were likely to continue with it. We, we looked at the average uh, level of battery discharge 
which is five and a half kilowatts. Um, the reason that seems low for a typical power wall, for example, is that it's a three hour discharge signal. So you, whatever your battery capacity is, is uh, divided by three and that's your average over that three hour period. So um, that's, that's why that looks like that. And the payout is based on that average participation across a season. But it's an average hourly participation. So the current summer payment rate for residential customers enrolling in the program in Massachusetts is $225 per kilowatt, again, based on this average. Uh, so if you kind of multiply it out, uh, it indicates that the average customer, residential customer, was paid a little over uh, $1,200 for the summer season that year. And if you add in the winter season and kind of calculate it out, uh, it indicates you could achieve a payback in about six years as a residential customer. The program has also been quite effective in terms of the overall um, deployment of energy storage uh, batteries. Uh, you can see here that we are just a little, uh, just around 300 megawatts capacity uh, deployed under this program um, after two and a half years. The um, majority of this is commercial industrial because they tend to be much larger capacity batteries, but there is about three megawatts of residential storage in the program and the rest of that residential component is, is thermostat load controls. Uh, this Connected Solutions program was initially developed uh, by National Grid as a thermostat uh, load reducer program. Batteries were then added so there is a uh, pretty good sized legacy uh, component of thermostatic load controls in the program. And I, just, to, just to mention one thing here, if you look at the bottom uh, red dotted line here, that is the Massachusetts Clean Peak goal for 2020. They have a Clean Peak program in Massachusetts. This program alone has exceeded that initial goal by a factor of three. So here's a project economics example from the customer's perspective. If you were a commercial customer and you installed a 60 kilowatt hour battery and signed up for a summer daily dispatch program at a rate of $200 per kilowatt, assuming that you responded to every dispatch signal and that your battery was fully charged every time, uh, you would, here's how you calculate it. So the 60 kilowatt hour battery can at best provide a 20 kilowatt load reduction averaged over that three hour dispatch call, 20 times three is 60. Uh, you then multiply that average 20 kilowatt load reduction by the $200 incentive rate and you get a $4,000 maximum seasonal payout for this summer season. Again, that's for a 60 kilowatt hour battery at a commercial establishment. Uh, the table here just kind of summarizes uh, some of the values for residential program participants in the different states based on uh, different sizes and types of commercially available batteries. And uh, you can look at that at your leisure. I also want to touch on the cost benefit of this program. This chart uh, comes from that uh, Connecticut proposal I mentioned. The, the Gr Connecticut Green Bank ran cost benefit analyses for these behind the meter batteries. And they did it for uh, five different tests. And these are tests commonly used by states to assess the cost benefit of various technologies that are considered for incentive programs. So some states use the SCT test, some use the RIM test, some use the you know, uh, PCT, et cetera. Uh, the, I won't go into the details. I'm sure there are folks on the call that are more familiar with, with the details of these tests than I am, only to point out that, um, in fact, energy storage passes um, the tests. And you can see on the right here, the different tests consider different benefits. And so, you know, it varies depending on which test you're using. It also varies depending on what your assumptions are. Uh, as inputs. So you can't just take this and kind of adopt it whole, whole scale. You, you really have to do these, te the, whatever the appropriate test is for your own program using your own inputs. But this is just to illustrate that storage uh, really does uh, 
it really is cost effective uh, for a number of these tests, and at least in Connecticut and also in Massachusetts, uh, past there and in Rhode Island. So we think that, um, you know, we'd, we'd love to see additional cost benefit tests done in other regions of the country. Um, I also want to point out that this uh, RIM, ratepayer impact measure, um, scoring above a one on that test indicates that there's not cost shifting going on. Um, so that's a very interesting result. Uh, and I just just wanted to point it out. So that's my uh, that's my presentation. I, I am happy to answer questions. We have uh, produced lots of reports, webinars, and other materials, and they're all available on our website, um, freely available. So um, you know, if there's something that I can answer here, I'm happy to. But I also want to just uh, you know direct you to. Uh, feel free to, to go to our website, look through our publications library, look at our webinar archive, et cetera, and, um, you know, uh, feel free to <clears throat> pull out anything that's useful to you. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate the presentation. Uh, any questions, concerns for Todd? She must have answered everyone's questions, sir. Oh, no, Mr. McNeil, you're up. All right, Kitson McNeil from uh, the administration. I just have a- Can you hear me? Oh, um, oh sorry, this is this is Joe Loper. I just had one one observation uh, that's coming that uh, uh, people may want to think about, and that is with respect to the rate impact test, um, that uh, energy efficiency programs are almost always not cost effective according to a rim test uh, but they uh, for the EV and the storage and some of these other uh, distributed energy resources the uh, rate impacts are a critical benefit um, to those programs and so it's a discount when the, uh, in conversations about kind of syncing up uh, the EE programs with other types of resources uh, that that's going to be a challenge or something we're going to have to wrestle with Thank you, sir. Uh, Kitson. Uh, thank you, Judge. I'll always let Joe Loper have the floor, so that, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kitson. Uh, just a couple, couple questions. I just wanted for my own um, clarification. So these are customer-owned, essentially, batteries. Am I getting? Am I missing something there? Uh, they, they are either customer-owned or leased. Um, okay. And and I should point out that there are there is one major utility customer battery program it happens to be right here in Vermont, Green Mountain Power, where the utility actually owns the batteries but puts them behind the customer's meter. They have three thousand of them uh, in the field, and they have uh, well documented um, uh, cost savings associated with that. But but the program that I'm I'm talking about here, Connected Solutions really uh, is based on the idea that customers either own the batteries or lease the batteries um, and and then uh, contract them to the utility on a pay for performance basis. Okay. And again, just not to belabor the point, just to be clear, the customer is paying for the ownership or lease of the, the battery in the example that you provide. Uh, correct. And and I, I should add that um, you know, we're aware that this is, um, you know, this technology is, costs have come down, but it's it's not a cheap technology. Um, there are a number of different ways to make this accessible and affordable. In Massachusetts, for example, there is a 0% interest heat uh, pro loan program, which applies to uh, anything in the, in the energy efficiency uh, program so that would apply to batteries as well. You can get a zero percent interest loan, um, and then the performance payments go against the loan payments. You know, in in Connecticut, they're proposing to provide an upfront rebate, and also to double that for low income uh, customers who qualify through whatever their their eligibility standards are for that. 
uh, which would be very, very helpful. And we're actually recommending Massachusetts do the same. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of ways to, to kind of slice it. Um, you know, there's on-bill payment, there's, there's, there's ways to, to try to make it more accessible for customers. And we would really encourage that, you know, there's a lot of creative thinking that could be done around that. Um, yeah, ways to, to allow customers to enroll in these kinds of programs without having to, uh, you know, uh, meet a very high uh, cost bar. Okay. All right. Thank you for that clarification. And just one other thing, I guess the, in terms of the benefit to um, customers, essentially they're charging the batteries with, you know, their, with their metered service potentially, if they, unless they have some sort of distributed energy resource. And then the offsetting cost that they're, I guess the benefit they're getting is that through the peak demand payment that they're reducing, correct? Yes. Okay. And, and um, you know, you, this, is, this program is, is really for storage. Um, I should note that, that the states that are running this also have, you know, solar incentive programs. And in some cases, a solar program with a storage adder. There's ways to combine that, the programs uh, in order to encourage people to, to charge these batteries from solar. But yeah, there's, you know, it really is based on, uh, on incenting the customer to, to charge during, uh, you know, off peak times or from solar and then discharge during, during peak hours. Okay. And one final thing, if you could comment on, in terms of the participant cost test that I, I think that was the one that was the lowest of the, um, benefit cost test, but that's looking at cost to the participant. So if you could just give you know share some insight as to why that one is lower than um, the others, um, it, uh, that would be helpful. So thank you. Yeah, um, I hesitate to speak to that and only because I didn't conduct that analysis that is taken from the Connecticut Green Bank's uh, analysis. And it's included in the Connecticut Pura Straw proposal, uh, which is on the street right now. And I, I just think it would, it, you know, I just don't want to mischaracterize it. So it, it's probably better to just take a look at their um, at their materials. Okay. But um, yeah, I mean, this is, yeah. I'll just leave it at that. I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to mischaracterize what they what I, they did. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right, thank you, sir, and thanks for those questions. Uh, anybody else? Uh, let's see. Um, actually, there's a, there is one question uh, in the chat box. Have you offered in PJM market? That's uh, what I'm trying to do right now. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't offered in the sense that I don't I don't administer this program. This is something that's been adopted uh, through state energy efficiency programs, uh, and and administered by the utilities in those states in New England. To my knowledge, it, it, this particular program has not been run in, P, in a PJM uh, state, but, uh, and I'm aware that the, the underlying market, um, you know, valuation of things like, uh, you know, the peak pricing and so forth is gonna be different in PJM than it is in ISO New England. It's gonna be different everywhere. So uh, yeah, there, you know, again, this is not a one size fits all. It's a model that we think is is um, valuable and worth uh, looking at, and hopefully, um, you know, could be uh, adapted to to work in other markets where um, you know uh, capacity, for example, may have different values than it does in in New England. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, last call. All right, thank you very much, sir. Um, thank you, I really appreciate it. Sure. Um, um, Brian and Kitson, I know you guys didn't submit uh, comments for this round, but uh, since you since you both made um, presentations last week uh, and they were pretty detailed uh, in terms of where we are, I didn't. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to touch on anything today that you've heard that. Um, may have impacted uh, your proposals one way or the other. Uh, thank you, Judge. At this point, uh, we don't have anything. I don't have anything to add. Um, you know, I, I guess I will make one 
additional comment on the conversation this morning with the utilities. I was not in any way trying to imply that there isn't a, a role for shorter life measures. I just, you know, as I said, the, the goal is being structured to encourage uh, more longer life measure, but there is still a, a role for shorter life measures in, in the portfolio and the utilities have shown that in what they've done. So, so just, just wanted to add that, but nothing. All right. Else. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Brian, did you want to add anything to, to what you uh, su submitted last week? I know you, uh, you've probably gotten more references than anybody else here uh, for the last I, I appreciate of beating the <laughs> reference library for the working group, which is a, a good honor. Um, no, I think uh, the conversation has been really helpful. And I think um, from our vantage point, you know, the, the goals that we put together and, and what we've been talking about, I think are moving in a positive direction. So I don't know that I have a ton else to add. Um, just that I think, you know, uh, I'm uh, appreciative of a lot of the, the additional uh, details and proposals that folks have brought to bear. And I think it's adding, uh, you know, I think it's continuing to flush out some of the things that we've all been working on. And I think that's been, um, I think again, encouraging. Well, good. good. It sounds like at least you think we're moving in the right direction. So that's... Uh, well, that's, if you think I, we're I mean, moving in the right direction, that's the most important <laughs> thing. But. Well, well, I mean, uh, if we can get some consensus, that'll be the right direction. Uh, again, I'm not, Judge Burke and I are not making decisions here. So we're just kind of facilitating. Um, uh, to circle back before I let everybody off the hook, um, uh, Mr. Gravatt had uh, uh, kind of raised the question as to exactly what is considered uh, outside the meter uh, by the utilities. Um, is there, uh, can I put somebody on the spot to kind of give us a uh, outside the meter 101 so we uh, know what we're talking about? Come on, Pearl, you there? Uh, let's see who else was here earlier. <laughs> Jeff Trout, Doug Mykeel, come on, somebody out there? I guess we could come up with our own definition and they'll have to live with it. Hold on just one moment. <laughs> All right. And I'll apologize uh, in advance for putting you on the spot. So while we're waiting for some other folks from joining, um, would it be possible for us to um, just reply kind of in written form via email to the group um, rather than having something uh, now? I think because we need to, I think we're missing a few people at the moment and I don't want to give the wrong answer, so. Sure, uh, yeah, that that that's fine. Um, yeah, again, I don't want to put put somebody on the spot uh, obviously, I'm, I'm actually trying to do that. I'm not trying to. I mean, usually, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to just make voice. something up, but you know. Right. right. <laughs> no, I, I hear you. I hear you. Um, all right. Does that is that sound okay, Eric? Yeah, no, I, I think you know Megan. Um, you know, it's in the direction we're going, and I mean, we did we did offer up a few things earlier. I think you know, obviously you guys would like some more specifics so that I think the best thing would be probably for us to give you guys some more specifics on what it is that we're thinking. I, I know that we, we mentioned transformers earlier. We mentioned community based projects um, that might include renewables. So um, I, I think maybe at this point it'd be best for us to kind of come back to the group with some specifics. Okay. That, that'd be fine. Um, and our next meeting is set for Thursday. Is that something you could, you know, again, it doesn't have to be uh, um, a, a term paper, you know, if you could kind of give us an overview of, uh, you know, what the utilities consider to be outside the meter and um, how those, um, how those relate to empower. I think that's kind of what Mr. Gravatt is looking for. 
or sir, are you can still you there? Just add one thing though. Um, oh, go ahead. We're happy to. I mean, certainly there are some of the, like Eric mentioned, some of the things that we have talked about already, you know, around the right. transformers and some other items, but, uh, and, and we will get back with additional examples, but I guess the one thing that I did just kind of want to lay, just float out there on this particular topic is that regardless of what, um, you know, what ultimately, you know, even if we left it open to without any limitations theoretically on what could be included towards the goal. I think ultimately the commission is, will have the authority to, you know, to say yay or nay on the inclusion of any savings. So I guess one hesitation that I would have even before we provide you with the more detailed explanation and the use to the group, not, and not to you Sarah specifically, but is that if we preclude things now, um, without having, you know, fully vetted them, or if things, you know, come up later, it, it's, it, I think it's a, creating a greater limitation, whereas there is already a regu like a regulatory structure in place to evaluate things and for their appropriateness for, for Empower. So once we've established the goal, you know, we're going to put forward our proposals, you know, on a cyclical basis as we do now, um, and the commission will have the opportunity to say whether or not things that are being included are appropriate or not, um, and, and on an ongoing basis. So, you know, I, we'll we'll put pen to paper on some things that we think are of interest at the moment. But I think that I, there is also the possibility that as some of these technologies mature, that there could be opportunities that we're we're not discussing now. Um, and I I don't want to close the door on them. Sure. Yeah. And I, and I don't think anybody's necessarily interested in doing that. And I think Mr. Gravatt actually, um, you know, had a specific, um, you know, kind of a place or a, I think he said no less than like 40% for like innovation. I think just what some of the parties were getting at is kind of what's going to be counted towards the goal. And if, and if we can all get on the same page as to what is or isn't counted towards that goal, it, I guess it'll be easier to, um, you know, kind of decide on what the goal should be, if that makes sense. Yes. Okay. Philip from LPC, I'm also curious about what what the process is um, outside of Empower for the utilities to to develop, um, you know, cost effective measures that would reduce load and that kind of thing. I know we talked about conservation, voltage reduction. I mean, is that something that would would have evolved? anyway or was that created specifically to address empower needs i guess that yeah <laughs> anybody, you're stuck. anybody want to respond to that or I was going to say, I, I think this might be one where we need the to- The Maryland Public pilot. Service Commission directed PEPCO to uh, develop a, a CVR pilot. Hi, this is Ethan Holmes, PEPCO. And we've since moved on from the pilot stage to implementing 85% saturation. Okay, so as part of the rate case, or a rate case, or was that a separate docket? That I don't have enough history for. It came before, I, before me, but it goes back at least to like 2012, I believe. Okay. Yeah, Phil, this is Jeff at Smeco. Um, he's right. It comes from a long history. I uh, came back probably before 2012 when we came around and asked everybody for ideas like we typically do on the end of a three-year cycle. And the utilities brought this forward back at that time and uh, piloted, explored those utilities that had the technology move forward with it and uh, continue to implement. Now, I'm just curious if there are any, un, you know, unexploited opportunities, you know, that are well on the utility side of the meter that would um, create savings and lower greenhouse gas emissions and that kind of thing. There's definitely, you know, peak shaving is something we can always address. Uh, various methods to do that, like the last presenter discussed a VPP, um, any kind of utility scale battery can be used to lower the peak load at a feeder during peak hours, um, or a distributed battery system. There's also, you know, 
we could be looking at increasing hosting capacity to increase the amount of saturation of so solar on a particular feeder if the feeder is already locked out and it can't take any more due to uh, saturation levels we can act we could come in and actually open up the feeder you doing some work there that's a possibility I understand that um, EV batteries can also possibly be used for peak shaving possibly although I've not, you know that is something you would have to work out with the drivers right. <laughs> Mr. Thank McLean, you. sorry, Jim. Hi, I'm Ethan, by the way. Oh, Good to meet you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Mr. Gravette, we cannot hear you. Doesn't look like you're muted. You're. All right, we'll come back to you, sir. <laughs> All right, Kitson. You can read lips. <laughs> you looked upset. Just a quick follow-up question on the, um, uh, I guess, question from OPC. In terms of the the um, distribution transformer program that is in Empower, is that technology different from, and if, you know, please indulge me, is that different from the transformers that are put on and put in your rate case? Is that, what is the difference between that and um, your normal operation where you change out transformers? Or is that the same thing? Um, Please, if you could provide some information on that. Sorry, that's a new one for me. Actually, I actually just, Kristen, I, I, I knew that was being directed at us, and I only heard the second half of the Transformers question. Could you repeat the question? I apologize. So, yeah, the question is, I mean, in your normal operation, my understanding of utility operation is that you go through your transformers, you change them out, they go into rate base. What is different about the ones that are included in, in or the savings that is being included in power? Is it is there a different technology? Is it something that's um, specific to Empower? Or is it just general transformers being changed out and added to rate base and the savings are counting towards Empower? We'll take that back as a question. Thank you. Well, well, no, I can answer that, Kits, and this is Doug. I mean, they're just normal transformers, right, that that have this. And if, if we change a transformer out, then it's not included in the Empower program. I mean, obviously, it's something that we put in rate base. I mean, it's a transformer. Okay. I was just curious. That's, that, I think that's sufficient. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Kitson. Yeah. Uh, this is Dan Hurley with STAP. And also, we have the energy storage pilot that's getting started up. We, in PC44, we have a couple of time of use rate design programs going on that aren't really within Empower, but you know those are other ways to have opportunities for peak savings and uh, energy savings with you know, using the pricing mechanisms. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Gravett. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Hooray. <laughs> Sorry about that before. Uh, temperamental technology. Um, so a couple of things. I mean, so uh, I appreciate uh, the utilities going back and, and taking a look at, at um, putting a little more definition on what, what they may be talking about for the other side of the meter. You know, my concerns, and we, we talk about CDR, I, I think there's some balance between creating incentive for the utilities to do things that make sense and that uh, opportunity being so big that it allows them to do some things instead of other things that also make sense. And the, what I'm referring to, of course, is CBR because, you know, we had a decision point in 2015, uh, the advocates, do we support the idea of allowing the utilities to claim savings for things that are not paid for with the Empower Surcharge. And we decided that it was appropriate to support that um, because we wanted exactly this issue we're talking about. We didn't want there to be a disincentive to do things, for utilities to do things that really made sense towards policy goal. But then what happened, in my view, and we've had a lot of conversations about that, is that because we have an annual savings target, even though nobody else claims a one-year life for CBR, including other Exelon companies, in Maryland, we say it's a one-year life and we claim the savings over and over and over again that doesn't make any sense to me. And I want to avoid perpetuation of kinds of 
goal framework that drive those kinds of choices. And again, I'm not like calling anybody out for that. This is what the regulation drives you to do. It's really hard for you not to do what the regulation drives you to do. It's the way utilities work in the regulated world. Um, the other thing I'm very interested in on this other side of the meter is scale. And again, the CVR case, you know, if we were talking about five or 10% of the savings, that'd be one thing. If it's 30 or 40% of the savings, that's kind of a different thing. And the reason it matters is related to the size of the goal and whether it keeps you from doing other things that make sense. So that's, that's my concern. I want to understand it more, what you're thinking about. And it's also what I proposed in our framework, uh, putting a, a placeholder for it that might have some bounds on it, if that all makes sense. I'll take away that I need to do a little research on the impact, the total uh, kilowatt impact. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Brett. Thank you, Ethan. Um, anybody else have anything? All right. Well, what I'm envisioning, at least for next week, is I don't I don't think we need necessarily need to have another round of comments um, based on today. But what I, I think what Judge Burke and I are, um, would propose to do, unless uh, someone else has a has a better suggestion, uh, and I'm all ears, um, is try to come up with uh, a chart based on the filings uh, thus far and try and see where we have some common ground and where we have some work to do in terms of uh, getting on the same page uh, in terms of how these goals should be structured. And uh, obviously, we can circulate that um, you know as quickly as possible. Um, and we could kick off next uh, next week's meeting with um, with the utilities uh, presentation. Again, I, I'm calling it a presentation, but just um, a dog and pony show about the uh, outside the meter um, um, information that you know we we've just uh, talked about to give the group a better understanding of the the, the type types of programs and the scale of the savings. Does that sound like an acceptable course? Um, one, <clears throat> excuse me, one question. Um, could you just clarify the expectations for participants at the next meeting? Like, should we pr be prepared to give feedback on specific proposals or more just have high-level discussion? Well, we've only got, right now, as the plan is, we've only got two more meetings for this. So if we're not going to get specific next week, um, I think the, the final meeting is going to be too late. Um, and while um, I know we have time built in uh, at the end, um, and you know, if we need to add more meetings just so we get the goal structure you know, right, um, you know, I'm happy to add those. But you know, I'd like to start kind of delving down into the specifics rather than just having high level discussions, um, you know, at some point in time. And I realize that we're not all going to agree or we, um, or the stakeholders are not necessarily going to agree on everything and that's fine. But, um, you know, we got to start moving forward at some point. Um, you know, I appreciate uh, the parties who, who, who uh, kind of delved down and gotten specific. Um, but yeah, we need to, we need to be ready to kind of start putting the pencil to the paper here. That would be, at least be my expectation. Your Honor, would you then expect each party to put together their own chart and estimation of where their positions lie with respect to the other parties? Yeah. Or I mean, is one person going to do that? Well, I think, I mean, I, I'm going to try and do something based on the filings that have been made thus far and circulate that. And I'm sure I'll probably get some things incorrect in terms of where people stand. Um, but I'll, I'm going to try. I think we just need to have some kind of framework to start from, uh, to start, uh, you know, seeing where we can, you know, maybe reach an agreement on a goal. And to the extent that we can't reach an agreement, um, you know, at least present some goals, uh, some some good quality goals for the commission to consider. If, if that makes sense. Great idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're you're very kind, Mr. Sheehan. So, all right, uh, anybody else? 
I, I hope that makes sense. Um, I'll try and get something around to the group as quickly as possible. Uh, I'll apologize in advance if I misstate your position. It's not that I'm trying to um, make consensus where there's not, but it's just uh, an, possibly an error on my point on my part. So, all right. With that, I will wish everyone an early uh, week, uh, happy weekend, and uh, we'll see everyone next Thursday. Thanks again for for uh, participating. Thanks. Have a safe weekend, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.